I was watching an old movie, and maybe it was a fragment of what I heard in there, but, but, but really, uh, was just this, this, this chord that kept coming back to me, and it was kind of, the beginning of the whole piece was these three notes. And then this note. So you got to play those together. I think that's a conversation I'm having with the Almighty in music.
all throughout the piece, um, no matter where it goes, um, it comes back to as kind of like a, it's a, one might call it a chorale figure, like in Bach, you have chorales, but uh, it, it, these are icons that keep reappearing uh, in the piece. And um, sort of as, as much as I can do the, uh, the sound of a painting in my mind, you know, and, 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 um, uh, and they're, um, they're, very, they're meant to be very romantic and some very beautiful. Uh, and then at some point they, they splinter off and become a little bit ambiguous. But I, I think uh, it's influenced by order, of course, and boundaries. And um, but uh, the most beautiful thing about beauty, to me, is um, the freedom, is um, and freedom to make choices and um, finding something in yourself that you you know. Um, or maybe maybe it resonates with a part of you that is as you you might feel is very dark. You know, I have parts of me that I feel very dark, but I need them uh, in order to to journey. And and so for me anyway, um, um, beauty is not about tranquility. You know, it's not about peace necessarily. Uh, can be, um, but um, opens the door to. Uh, more um, something that you, you wish you could be co completely free, but of course you, I don't think you can be. But uh, um, so it's 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 intoxicating because it's it it, en it enlivens you and it it's ener it energizes you. It doesn't put you to sleep. One of the challenges when working on a new score is to take the music that's on paper and try to imagine what it would sound like with a choir, with the voice. Uh, I try to use following kind of little help for myself, which is uh, the idea of having a little chip like a sound bank that has Procore Canada sound and sonority on it. And I kind of like put that into my mind and I imagine what the choir sounds like, who the singers are in the choir, uh, from the lowest voice to the highest voice. I know them personally, I know their, their uh, timbre, the color, the vibrato, the dynamic. So I kind of create this image of sound and it's on those little chip. And then I look through that sound lens at the score or the score starts growing through this kind of sonority. Um, I could also take the chip out and put a different chip in another choir I've worked with, uh, so here the piece slightly different. In that sense, I always try to um, imagine the whole choir as a big soundboard, 
uh, where each singer might be a, a fader and has, you know, kind of like volume adjustment, if you would like to use that um, idea. And so I know what each voice sounds like and I can create an image uh, of sound that uh, reaches into this piece and makes it appear in front of me in my mind, which I can then uh, try to go to the actual choir and say, here's what I think it should sound like. This is my interpretation. Now, the important thing is to just use this as a baseline. Once I stand in front of the choir, I actually need to work with the people there. I can't just rely on my, my image. I need to hear what do they sound like on the day. Uh, has their voice changed? Um, do they feel today they should sing louder or softer? And that then creates the live performance that we are working on. So all the things that I like to pay attention to are dynamics changes, tempo changes especially. Um, that's really important to just make a mark of because otherwise you get caught off guard and then sadness and woe ensues for me or for the conductor or for both of us. I like to use the hourglass shape as kind of like a a form to to maybe explain that a bit more. So at the bottom of the hourglass is a very wide uh, round part where I start just researching in this instance with the text by St. John from the Cross. Where did he live? At what time did he live? What were his influences? 
um, the architecture at that time in Spain, for example, the paintings, the paintings by El Greco in Spain at that time, um, other literary sources, and just kind of get an image of like, this is who he was, and this is how the text that we're using in this piece, the four stanzas, how they would have been conceived, maybe. Um, also, I need to know a little bit more about Peter Tony, the composer. Um, now, I know Peter, so that part of the, of the, of the context is already uh, in, in my mind and in my experience. From there, I then start working slowly into that shape of the hourglass. I'm going to look at the actual score, I'll look at the grand structure, how is it shaped with the five movements. Um, how do the four stanzas that uh, St. John of the Cross has written kind of translate into those five movements? What other texts did uh, Peter use? Um, and then from there I go into each movement, into each line, into each melody, into each harmony, all the way to the actual word, like how do I want this word to be sung or uh, sounding? What's the interpretation? Is it emphasized? Um, and so on. From that like very very focused point then the hour class slowly starts to open again and I go again from a larger view okay this is the detail this is how it fits in a context this is how the individual movement is this is how these five pieces work together to create this overarching structure and that then informs uh, how I do interpret it, how I conduct it, how I show a phrase with the gesture. Then I have to go further up in his hourglass shape and bring in again the community, which is the performers, and try to transfer my knowledge and my interpretation to the singers and the performers. And then opening the hourglass even further, we come to the performance and to include the audience and the community at large. This is what we have worked uh, on and this is what the piece is and this is how we present it. Hopefully this hourglass shape then kind of starts in forming a next piece, a next study and the next focus point which is opening then again. That's it. Go from the deep prayer, uh, that's when the uh, bass has started, with this gospel D. And Tennis, can you grow more into that next note so we really hear the, like the D is, is, in, is in the basses. I need, maybe we should have all the tennis go to the E, go all to the E tenor tooth, so we have more of that. And don't sing the D. See here if he hears that. Three and two. Um, soprano, uh, sorry, that's you, altos and tenors, can you, where we just stop, already on flame, do a bigger decrescendo, oh living flame, when you come to the law of split chord or split intervals, that you're much quieter there. Um, It's the vowel drop. Kyrie Elle. Le. Use the L just to bring more resonance into that um, that vowel.
cut a full quarter at the end of page 79, please. Oh, burn. <coughs> next measure, yeah. next page 80. Six. Oh, sweet. Burn out. Is it? It's what do we want? G sounds better. G sounds better well, or G sharp? In that case, no. Should we do it? <laughs> 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 No, let's go with minor. Let's go, with minor. Let's go from how tenderly, how tenderly. It's always easy to add a third in major. How tenderly, fifty. Minor. And now. Something that was in the left hand in here that, and not in you. And, um, uh, uh, was that it? Yeah. What bar is that? Yeah, that's bar 71. Do you want? Yeah, I don't have anything. Oh, uh, bar. 71. I've got that. But how about right before that, in, um, right before my big gliss? Uh, yes. Bar mm -hmm. 63, 62, are those, is that where you're? No. No, I think it was uh, before that. Um, I can't, it's, it's gone now. Okay, it'll, we'll, we'll find it. Yeah. Um, should we, you know, uh, should we mention about bar 64 now, maybe? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. When you get to bar 64, um, uh, we can just let this ring, mm -hmm. just make that an open bar because it yeah. rings. It, we I'll put it for a moment. Just let it, it ring yeah, because it's really beautiful and then when it fades, it can ring. I can come in with it. Yes. Unless you want to, unless we want a, a little bit of bleed underneath the soprano, could be very cool. Mm -hmm. okay. So we can. Yeah, that, you know. I mean, in, I think it would be nice to have the, like into the egg, into the rework. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Joseph, you said something. I just want to ask you a question. Yeah. Um, at fifty-five, mm -hmm. um, that's my solo there. I, I can give you more sound than I was giving if you want. It's, it's really quite dramatic. Fifty-five. Oh yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, it's just it's just really it's quite really, strident. Yes, it, it almost brittle actually. Yeah. So so yes, that would okay. be great. So just coach me, coach me through okay. that. Okay. Yeah. So you can make that a lot better. Yeah. Longer. Okay. Thanks. I'm gonna play a bit with the voicings to get more sound. Yeah, sure. You okay. tell me which you prefer. Oh, okay. okay. Cool. You wanna try that now or? Uh, yeah. So you can hear. Yeah. Uh, what you've got written is what I'm doing, but I think if I can sustain some of the voices, it will give you more power. Um, you've got this here. Instead of the articulations on the first beat, if I do this. You want more sound? Absolutely. Okay. I'll play with this a bit. Yeah. This particular commission by Peter Tongi um, reflects my um, passion and conviction that the, the accordion, in order to be understood by audiences, has to assume 
the same kind of responsibility that any other instrument assumes on the concert stage. And in order to do that, an instrument has, has to evoke emotion. So the, the first part of the challenge is to find a composer who really appreciates that. Because a lot of scores today are just visually uh, pieces of art. But when you want to perform it, it takes an inordinate amount of time to learn, and it, it's only appreciated by a very, very small number of people. In the case of Peter's writing, this work will have legs, and I'm, I'm confident that it will have legs for many, many years, because it connects with people. There's a background story uh, that is very close to Peter about um, the unknown, the unspeakable. He reflects that in his piece, and some people would say, you know, that's about spirituality. Uh, it has nothing to do with religiosity or religion. It has to do with spirituality and sensing what's out there that's unknowable, but you can feel it. And it's an intangible. So when you start working on a score like this, where the composer's trying to create an emotion that's going to come off the stage about a subject like that, that's a very special work. Winter Vespers, and um, Take care. you know, walked in there, and just all of a sudden, my soul just It was the smell, it smelled holy, it was, it was of course everything that you have, like, on the those but this, this peace and just depth that I never felt before. So I came home from Vespers. And my, mom, my, my wife said to me, so are you going to convert? Because <laughs> she's pretty smart, you know. She smelled the incense she's off. She's pretty smart. <laughs> and that was it. I just sort of said, yes, I can do this. And got to know uh, Father Vladimir uh, Tobin, was the priest there. We had many, many talks over the summer. He gave me lots of books to read. It took a long time reading. And, and um, just couldn't resist it any longer. But literally, it was like a light you know, my soul just like, So it was the liturgy itself, the service. Yes. yes. But drawing me into a much deeper relationship with Christ, because to me, that Jesus prayer was everything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And um, it, was, it, was, it was a journey to be closer to Christ. Yeah. But it was the holiness of the liturgy that drew me. And, um, I, I do quite a lot of music in the Catholic circles. You know, I have a church choir and quite a lot of sacred music, which is uh, Catholic. But Catholics, unfortunately, have thrown a lot of mysticism away. They've got, gotten rid of it. The music yeah. isn't what it used to be. And it's the whole, you know, our church isn't too bad, but there's something missing. You know? I just didn't feel, eventually, I just didn't feel home. Well, I'm kind of curious, when you write sacred music, like, was it more 
say in the older tradition or something new because I know like even Dave Rupek was yeah, that's and, cool I mean that's why yeah. he uh, yeah. became Roman Catholic himself because he wrote that I mass know. Well, that's a good, good question. Uh, the stuff that I write mostly is, is for, for thought Catholics is Latin and Greek. And, and I've okay. Written, uh, like mass settings I've done or uh, motets. Mm -hmm. But I do some in English as well. But also, I've, I'm, I've been writing these big concert works that are an hour long. At one day is about 45 minutes long. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that can be in English, can be in Latin. I did a setting of the Lamentations of Jeremiah oh. for, yeah, yeah. for a bass clarinet and, uh -huh. and, and fire. The bass clarinet is kind of the voice of Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Well, the piece that I have today is um, called The Living Flame of Love, and it's actually a text of St. John of the Cross. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I'm yeah. also using uh, Orthodox the Curie and, and, and uh, Gospel Depot Milo that I have in there, oh. repeated many, many times. Yeah. And, and um, so my inspiration for the piece really went to my new association with Orthodoxy, just hearing the Kyrie and Kyrie. You know, like, Orthodox takes sin seriously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, so, but this piece is for accordion and yeah. harp. And oh, harp. okay. Yeah. The, the accordionist uh, commissioned it, and you think accordion is like polkas? It sounds like the organ, it sounds like the human voice, and when you put the harp with it, there's this divine glow. You know, that, uh, and it gets kind of crazy here and there, because it's like I'm trying to say, you know, like, beware of tranquility, you know, <laughs> right? And so it gets pretty out there, some moments when it's just, you know, because life is life sometimes too, you know. It's almost connected with a little bit of flip yes. between.
elderly lady who was sitting behind me in the concert, and, and um, <laughs> she said to me, with tears in her eyes, she said, she said, there are two great musical experiences in my life. One was hearing Maria Callas, and the next one was hearing your piece. And I, I had no response, you know, I was just totally, totally blown away by that. And you know, people often say that, oh, well, older people don't like contemporary music. It, it's just music, it doesn't matter how old you are. Know? But it was a, one of the most, probably the most moving thing anybody's ever said to me after, after the premiere.